All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. This session is titled Advancing the Application of Immuno-Oncology to Improve Patient Care. Uh, I do, uh, I, I will give each person an opportunity to introduce themselves. And then we really want this session to be a very practical discussion. So we, we are hoping for a lot of audience participation and engagement. We've got several audience response questions, so please make sure that you're going to uh, use those keypads. And if you don't have a keypad, if you didn't happen to pick one up, then Michelle in the back has some extras back there for you. Uh, so my name is Joe Kim. I'm with an organization called QSynthesis. And I've now been working with ASCP for the last four years on the immuno-oncology educational strategy. ASCP has an IO work group, and we've been forming uh, strategies as well as educational products. Uh, and many of you may have actually consumed some of these products on the ASCP website. So a lot of these IO educational modules are available as free online educational activities. And then we've also had the opportunity to go and visit several hospitals around the country to really work with not just the pathology and the lab team, but really the entire cancer care team in engaging them, looking at opportunities for process improvements. And so if you have not had a chance to visit the ASCP website, uh, we encourage you to take a look at some of these IO educational modules, and there are certainly more uh, that are going to be coming out as well. So with that, I want to first introduce uh, Dr. Shivakula, and please tell us about yourself as well as your cancer program. Um, thank you, Joe. Um, welcome to the session, everyone. My name is Mamata Chivakula. I am a, a breast pathologist, uh, but also a director for immunohistochemistry lab at Sutter uh, Healthcare, which is uh, located in Northern California. And our hospital is about 10 minutes away from San Francisco uh, Airport, so that's where the location geographics are. Uh, I'm also part of the Breast Cancer Advancement Program for the Mills Peninsula uh, uh, Cancer Center. Um, and uh, I'm just taking up the job as a co-chair for Education Committee for the ASCP starting this year from Phoenix, Arizona. So, uh, you want to tell them a little bit more about your cancer hospital here? Um, so. Uh, we, uh, Sutter is a health system, Sutter Healthcare is a, um, a health system that uh, serves the uh, patients in the Northern California area. And uh, we do have multiple hospitals across the Northern California and a little bit of Southern California as well. Uh, but the main hospitals are located uh, uh, in the in San Francisco area, which is uh, the Mills Peninsula Sutter Healthcare, where the main cancer center is located. Uh, but we also serve uh, other hospitals, which is the San Mateo County Hospital, uh, and also a Sequoia Hospital, which is also part of the Dignity Healthcare. So we are part of like four hospital systems uh, that where I see the patients. Uh, mm. Great, well, thank you very much. And um, Tori, please tell us about Baptist Cancer Center. So I'm the lead nurse practitioner for the Baptist Cancer Center. I manage the physician nurses, nurse navigators, and MPs for the group, and we cover three um, states, so the tri-state area, and have 17 locations um, throughout the area in a rural community that we service. Great, thank you. Dr. Zaretti? Okay, I'm the vice chair of SUNY Downstate uh, Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York as well as the medical director of two laboratories, uh, SUNY Downstate and Maimonides Medical Center. Now, our program includes three facilities. One is a city hospital, Kings County. Another one is the State University of New York in Brooklyn. And the third one is Maimonides Medical Center, which is much larger. They are there, has 700 beds, so and it has a huge cancer center with 100,000 patients a year. Our residents rotate through the three facilities. My talk today of our conversation will mostly be focused on Maimonides Medical Center, which is a private center. The other two are a state facility and a city hospital. Do you want to give us a little bit more descriptions about the cancer volume at Maimonides? We have a uh, 20,000 surgical specimens a year. Uh, the cancer center, as I mentioned, sees 100,000 patients a year. And there are 3,000 new diagnoses that are rendered each year of malignancies. Great. 
Thank you. So we intentionally developed a very diverse panel because the topic we're going to dive into is we know that these agents, these immune oncology agents, are widely being used throughout various settings throughout the country. And the issues that various hospitals and cancer centers are dealing with, are, there's a lot of variability in what those problems and issues are. Our hope is that we can share with you perspectives, sort of how we overcame some of those burdens and challenges uh, by talking about this. And to set the stage, we've got some background information that I'm going to just briefly go over. Uh, so some of the topics are going to focus around PD-L1 testing. And currently, in terms of these checkpoint inhibitors, the PD-1 as well as the PD-L1 inhibitors, there are now six on the market. And you'll see that each of them are associated with its own PD-L1 antibody clone, two of them being companion diagnostics. So those are in red, the 22C3 as well as the SP142. Those are companion diagnostic. However, the other ones are still also being used. So the 288, the 7310, as well as the SP263. And part of what we want to get into is how are we using these different tests? How, what do the clinicians understand about these tests, both in terms of ordering as well as interpreting the results? And how's that ultimately impacting patient decisions? We are going to touch a little bit on the way that these tests are interpreted. So we'll, you'll hear terms like tumor proportion score, TPS as well as combined positive score, CPS, that's used for the 22C3. And then a little bit also about how SP142 is, they're looking at both, uh, they're, they're looking at the tumor infiltrating immune cells uh, in terms of the percentage of what, you know, which are stained with the, um, uh, with the SP142 antibody clone. So with that in mind, we want to get into our first audience response question. Uh, so please pick up your keypads. And the question is, approximately how many PD-L1 tests are ordered each month within your institution? If your institution is a hospital or a cancer center, answer accordingly. If your institution is a pathology lab serv serving several hospitals, you can answer on behalf of your lab. Uh, so just take a minute and uh, go ahead and enter your responses. And then we'll see how everyone, res we'll see the results here in just a moment. All right, we'll advance now to the next slide to, to capture everyone's responses. Okay, so a lot, about half of you really not, not sure or just simply just doesn't apply. Uh, and then for the rest of you, it's really spread out. But I, I, it's interesting just to see the pattern. Uh, several of you must be in very high volume centers and some of you are in very low volume, small centers. And I think the issues that we're going to dive into is we're going to talk about things that I think are going to be pertinent and relevant regardless of whether you're high volume or low volume. So thank you for responding to that question. The current landscape is it revolves around these checkpoint inhibitors. They're currently FDA approved for all of these indications. Now, we didn't get into all the specifics of the ind indications. Rather, this is just to sort of set the stage. Uh, with, you know, the MSI high as well as the MMR deficient tumors, solid tumors sort of being a catch-all. But we, what we wanted to emphasize here is that there are certain indications where, once again, that companion diagnostic requirement currently applies. So you'll see it doesn't apply for many other tumor types, but in terms of these red cancers, this is where the companion diagnostic testing requirement is in place, where the FDA has sort of built that into the label. And for most cases, this is also what the insurance companies are going to request and demand prior to granting the prior authorization for treatment. So we're going to see continued increase uh, requests for PD-L1 testing. And at the same time, probably more confusion in the landscape about how these tests should be ordered, which test, which of those PD-L1 antibody clones, as well as how to interpret those results. Just wanted to also briefly highlight the first half of 2019 all the expanded indications with these agents. I'm not going to read through this list, but the point is simply to say that the landscape is rapidly changing and that pace of change is going to continue to accelerate. So we really need pathologists, lab professionals to not only understand what's happening, but to really be able to lead some of these discussions within their own institutions to ensure that the proper tests are being ordered as well as that those results are understood. To guide us through the discussion today, we have segmented the discussion into several topics. So we're going to spend some time talking about lung cancer first, and then we're going to dive into some other tumor types 
ending the discussion today around things like emerging biomarkers as well as the future direction of human oncology. Once again, wanting to keep everything very, very practical. So we're not going to dive into a lot of deep science or a lot of theory. We, we really want this to be very practice-oriented, practice-based. So with that in mind, the, the next question in terms of your audience response is, within your hospital or cancer center or pathology group, what proportion of advanced non-small cell lung cancer biopsy samples currently undergo pd one testing? So take a minute to respond to this. We'll give you about 20, 30 seconds to respond, then we'll see how people answered. So what proportion of those with advanced non-small cell lung cancer are receiving pd one tests? OK. So as we saw earlier, about half of you aren't really sure exactly how much pd one testing is occurring. And then we see 33% saying, yeah, it's over 80%. Not surprisingly, several of you are also in places where this is just not a routine part of the practice, even though it might be part of guidelines and so on. So we want to talk about why is that the case? You know, what should it be? What is it now? And where can we sort of make some improvements? Uh, so with that in mind, I want to, to get into some discussion with the, with the panelists. I want to just remind everyone that currently, as it relates to the various different types of lung cancers, whether we're talking non-small cell, small cell, as well as the different stages and different histologies, these are currently the agents that are FDA approved for the various indications. And the only pd one test that is a companion diagnostic requirement is the 22C3 for pembrolizumab. Doesn't mean that pd one testing isn't being done before those other agents are being used. It just simply means that it's not a required or mandatory companion diagnostic. But we are going to ask you all, how often are you using the pd one tests prior to using some of these other agents? Just a quick summary around these different agents, as well as their different indications. So as I mentioned earlier, we've got metastatic non-small cell covered. We've got now small cell, metastatic small cell. Uh, we've got unresectable stage three non-small cell indications. Uh, so the number of indications has rapidly expanded and grown, as well as within the 22C3 pd one test, the requirements according to what the FDA has indicated, you know, originally uh, some of these uh, for at least a single therapy agent was TPS greater than or equal to 50%. That was recently changed to greater than or equal to 1% now. So we've even seen some of the labeling changes just based on emerging data and, and the science. Uh, but ultimately now, when we think about, we've got stage four non-small cell lung, stage three non-small cell lung unresectable, and also now with small cell lung cancer, you know, the use of these agents we can predict is just going to continue to expand and grow. Are we equipped to handle the volume of requests? Are we equipped to really make sure that testing is being done appropriately, that we're not over-testing or that we're not entering the era of waste? And are we equipped to really make sure that the medical oncologists understand these results and are making appropriate clinical decisions uh, based on them? One thing that's currently happening within the medical community as it relates particularly to lung cancer is because of all of those different pd one tests that are available, there's, there are groups of people looking to see, can we harmonize these tests? Can we even possibly just use one test, regardless of which agent we're going to use? You know, is there an opportunity, perhaps, to, to just simplify and, and use one test? And one of the leading studies is the Blueprint pd one Comparability Project, which looked across the different antibody clones, the 22C3, 28.8, SP142, SP263, as well as that 7310. And they had an international panel of pathologists evaluate these uh, across the different tumor types. And what they essentially found is highly comparable staining by 22C3, 28.8, and SP263, less sensitivity with SP142, higher sensitivity with the 7310. But still, once again, the jury, I think, is still out as to, well, what does this mean on a practical level? What does this mean for our oncologists as well as for the insurance companies that are going to sort of you know, approve these therapies? Is it acceptable to do some interchanging or not? And as of right now, we don't hear of many organizations doing that type of pd one test interchanging. 
but I'd love to hear from the panelists, you know, what do they think is going to happen in the future, and is this something possibly that we're going to see it in next year? Uh, just another quick study here, 302 samples of non-small cell lung, 44 patients treated with nivolumab, pembrolizumab, as well as atezolizumab, and they use a lab developed um, for SP263 as well as 22C3, demonstrating both good analytical concordance as well as correlation with response when they sort of tracked these patients and looked at some of their outcomes. Uh, this study here looked at 198 cases, once again comparing to 22C3, SP263. What they found was at 50% cutoff, about half of the cases that would have been positive with the SP263 would have been defined negative with the 22C3. So I think we're going to see more of these sort of comparability studies and the topic of you know, interchangeability at a practical level. You know, are we there yet? Or are we going to see that? So now I want to turn to the panelists and sort of get your perspectives on the topic of pd one testing, on the topic of lung cancer. Uh, you know, tell us what's happening within your institution as well as within your patients who have advanced stage four lung cancer. You know, what percentage of them are undergoing pd one testing? So let's start with Dr. Shivakula. Um, so talking about pd one testing, we have gone through a lot of education through a multidisciplinary approach. And uh, we have met with the radiologists, we have met with the oncologists, and we all got together in a multidisciplinary team. And this all effort went in for two years. And finally, we came with a workflow algorithm. Uh, and uh, the oncologists have decided that they would be ordering PDL1 testing only on stage three and above patients in the metastatic setting as well. So in the terms of the, our workflow, a patient who is diagnosed with um, a, a, a lung ca cancer, we are still calling the oncologists and uh, asking if they want the molecular testing. And for the molecular testing, if they say yes, uh, we are running EGFR, AL, CROSS, and PDL1 all up front. So uh, we are sending out to outside laboratory uh, neogenomics, and uh, uh, we had, again, education about which clone to be used last year. But now everyone is aware of it. They assume that it's for Keturda, and if there's something else that they need for other organ system, they would specify that. But we have gone beyond that conversation. So when they tell us it's a molecular markers, we know the testing that needs to be done. So. And we are reserving the NGS testing uh, for patients, uh, uh, selective patients, uh, whom uh, they cannot, mm, it's decided by the oncologist and also by their choice whom they should send it out for NGS testing. Uh, still, that's where really it's kind of hazy. Uh, we haven't really come to a conclusion where who are the patients who are to be sent for NGS testing. But once they're sent to foundation, they're doing PDL1 as part of the NGS panel as well. So great, thank you. Tori, how about at Baptist? We um, have a lung multidisciplinary clinic, and there we do very streamlined reflex testing. Um, so it's automatically driven from the provider that kind of drives that clinic in that capacity. Outside of that, it's very much physician driven, and we use different labs depending on what additional testing outside of the pathology, whether it be PDL1 or the NG NGS or however. So it's very a lot of variety. Dr. Zaretti? For us, we also have multidisciplinary tumor boards, and we have them on all organs, but the lung tumor board, eh, the conclusion was all the stage three and above to order reflex a PDL1. And eh, just we have it standardized, and we also review the utilization of the test on our laboratory utilization committee, which is multidisciplinary and includes administrative staff. Mm -hmm. Great. I know one of the issues that comes up over and over with lung cancer is the lack of tissue. Lack of tissue quality, lack of tissue quantity. We're de often dealing with such small samples, and the oncologist may want multiple biomarkers tested. So how are your organizations dealing with the issue of quantity not sufficient? Or how are you working with your pulmonologists, your radiologists, and others, the surgeons, uh, to improve uh, the tissue quality and quantity uh, for these types of tests. So this time, Dr. Zaretti, if you could start. Okay, well, my uh, uh, 
oncologists and surgeons, they know that for us, I emphasize many times that tissue is the issue. So you should give us as much as possible you can provide us. Because not only we need to do the markers that we know now, but in the future, new markers might appear and we might need to retrospectively go to the, the, bi the biopsy that was obtained and we don't want to exhaust that tissue. So as much as it is possible, I encourage my radiologists, surgeons, to provide us as much tissue as it can possibly be. Only 1% of our samples are not sufficient for processing. We don't have enough tissue, so it's less than one. Mm -hmm. So I'm pretty satisfied with the process at Maimonides Medical Center. Great. Tori, how about you? We have actually done a system-wide initiative to standardize our lab kits um, with radiology and the surgeons so that they, um, as far as number of samples and kits that uh, we use across, since we have such a variety across the three states. Um, that has helped a lot. I will say we still have some issues and barriers there, but that's been a system-wide initiative that has made a lot of um, decreasing our opportunities that we don't have enough to tissue. And Dr. Shivakula? Um, so every time I say that we had made progress uh, in the past uh, one and a half years, but then we start to have some issues again uh, with the tissue. Um, so basically we have tissue that mm, comes from the radio interventional radiologists and from the pulmonologist. So we get the specimens from both of them. So uh, I see a variety of uh, techniques that used by the radiologists as well as the pulmonologists. Uh, some are really good and some are really, uh, we get poor yield of the specimen. So what we did was uh, with our director and myself, uh, uh, we approached the pulmonologist who consistently was giving the small amount of tissue, which was insufficient. Uh, um, and talked to him about the technique and showed the slides and everything, started to educate him on uh, and probably also encouraging him to talk to his other colleagues and also to the radiologists as well, uh, the type of the needle, the procedure, everything that needs to be done. So uh, coming to the bony samples, what we did was uh, um, we, our, uh, our PAs are aware of it now. They are taking the soft tissue off from that and we're creating two different uh, blocks for the bony samples. And the, for the bony uh, parts of it, uh, we have moved into a light decal protocol. And that's kind of helping us a lot in the specimen, uh, uh, saving the specimen part of it. And also our oncologists are now kind of tuned to what we are saying to them that bony samples doesn't work. This is uh, what it works. You know, If you have multiple metastatic sites, please go for more of the solid areas of the metastatic sites. Uh, um, so in this process, we kind of uh, tighten that QNS thing, um, and uh, our rates of QNS are pretty much like one to two percent, uh, and it's uh, been low. Part of it is like proactively the pathologists uh, when they make a diagnosis, calling them, telling them the type of the tissue that they have. So you know, great. So it, the the communication part obviously is critical. You know, later on, we're going to talk about a national study that was done by a major reference lab where they had higher quantity not sufficient percentages or rates than what you all are describing. Uh, but it sounds like, uh, you know, just engaging your clinicians in all of these discussions is critical. Uh, Dr. Zaretti, when prior to this panel, I had asked you, you know, tell us about your bio biomarker testing process, you know, how much are your surgeons ordering, how much are you, the others ordering. So. Tell us what happens within your institution. Well, it, it was, uh, it's a, still is a work in progress, but we have it more standardized now. It was very chaotic when I joined the institution, but uh, we do have a cancer center, and the consensus was that the oncologists were the ones who were going to be the ultimate determinants of the process. And uh, the test is a lab-initiated order. We uh, determine when we get the lungs, we already establish that there's going to be a reflex, and pathologists enter and process the sample. So we send it out for testing, and once the results come back to us, these results are uh, this a uh, brief summary of the result which is released by the pathologist who of course has access to the complete report from the outside testing laboratory and the original, the whole original uh, report is attached 
and available in a repository for all the clinicians, the oncologists to see the results. Mm -hmm. We've gone to other cancer centers around the country where it seems like the person who orders these tests really varies. In some places, it might be uh, the physician who orders the test, uh, perhaps the proceduralist who performed the biopsy. In other, in other settings, it might be the nurse who sort of fills out the requisition form, and when he or she sees a list of four or five pd one options, may not know which one to click. So we've heard of many situations where ordering these tests has become a lot more complex and often can lead to confusion as well as, you know, the care coordination opportunities. So, Tori, I know that when we were talking, you mentioned that within Baptist, there's this, there's this da dashboard. You know, tell us about that. So we have um, recently, with the OCM, uh, CMS project, added navigators to a lot of our medical oncology sites. And so one of the challenges has, of course, been around testing and finding that. And so we've developed a dashboard that works out of our EMR system to track tasks. And so if the um, oncologist decides whatever we're going to order, but there's got to be a way to close the loop since it's not integrated into the EMR system as far as the result. So the navigator actually has um, the task and a due date, and so it'll track on a report, and then they have to complete it, or it shows as outstanding, like pending, so that there's a way to um, have an accountability and close that gap. Great. And for those of you who may not be as familiar with the OCM, the OCM is the Oncology Care Model uh, Medicare pilot, you know, originally started out with close to 200 practices around the country, really looking at a value-based model for delivering cancer care. It since decreased in terms of number, uh, but they've added not only navigation, but really building in processes to improve on efficiencies, really looking at the patient's voice. And one of the, the most recent additions to the oncology care model is something that focuses heavily around shared decision making when making the treatment decisions with the patient. Um, so it's been really valuable to, to work with cancer centers around the country, some that are participating in the oncology care model. So we could talk for a lot longer on lung cancer, but because we wanted to cover a lot more topics, we're now going to get ready to shift gears and talk about breast cancer. And so get ready with your keypads, because the next question is, um, what is the definition, definition of a positive pd one test for patients who have metastatic triple negative breast cancer who are treated with atezolizumab? So take a minute and look at those definitions and then select one. Give it a few more seconds for the remaining folks to enter in your results. And this is how everyone responded. Okay. So the correct answer is C, and this is based on the FDA label and indication. And I think the, this sort of just reemphasizes the complexity of even keeping track of how these different tests are interpreted. Um, so let's talk about this. Let's talk about atezolizumab and SP142. And the fact that now you're looking at tumor infiltrating immune cells, not the tumor cells, but rather the immune cells, covering greater than or equal to 1% of the tumor area. And this came from the indication and the approval from March of this year. Uh, so prior to this year, no uh, checkpoint inhibitor was FDA approved for breast cancer. Now we've got this first indication for metastatic triple negative breast. And what we heard is that throughout the country, many organizations, breast centers, surgeons, medical oncologists, and pathologists were really just kind of scrambling to say, all right, we now are going to anticipate an increased request. Volume of pd one tests, uh, it's, a, it's a subset of patients. It's not all breast cancer patients, but really just a small subset of patients. And uh, at the same time of this indication, the FDA also approved the Ventana pd one assay. And this is all based on the Compassion 130 study, uh, which, once again, we're not going to get into the study details, uh, but rather that you know, we're still collecting ongoing longitudinal data from many of these studies associated with mo most of these drugs. So with that in mind, we wanted to dive into how is pd one testing done for breast cancer within your own institutions? And is it still just being requested on a single basis? Are there institutional sort of systems 
processes in place to identify these patients and test them. Um, so doc, Dr. Shivakula, tell us about pd one testing for breast cancer within your hospital. So um, I think it's much more uh, the way the pd one testing for the metastatic triple negative breast cancers come out with the indication. Uh, we quickly adopted it pretty much into our workflow. Part of the reason with the breast team in our institution is that we have a very strong multidisciplinary tumor board on every Monday and um, the, where we discuss all the new indications, including some of the new stuff that has come. And uh, we quickly decided that uh, we run the ERPR HER2 on all the metastatic sites, and if they turn out to be triple negative, go on to order the PDL1 testing. So that has been implemented as a reflux testing now. Um, although I see other problems with the metastatic sites, uh, we are not seeing the immune cells, we are not seeing some, uh, the quantity of the tumor cells, the majority of the times it's the bony sample. Uh, so the, those challenges remain, but uh, just adopting to this test uh, as a reflex test was uh, much more convenient. Uh, you know. mm. So if we think about the process, the flow, Dr. Shivakula, you said you, know, you do your ERPR, your HER2, at what point does the pathologist or oncologist know this patient has metastatic disease? Is that something that takes several days for that information to finally get to you, or? Well, I mean, like depending on the biopsy, like if it's not the primary uh, uh, site, if you're looking at bone, liver, and everything, and you run your workup, and it turns out to be something not, you know. And sometimes we do see within the uh, clinical notes that question mark metastatic breast cancer. So uh, we have different ways, and also we have the oncologists communicating with us uh, uh, because their uh, the starting of the treatment is pretty uh, quick. That's part of the uh, uh, reason they uh, jump in, talk all the pathologists, just say that this is a patient who had a breast cancer two years ago. Now, now is presenting with multiple metastatic sites, so we just want to know this is what it is. So, you know. Hmm. Dr. Zaretti, how yeah. about at your lab? It was a similar experience for us because it was promptly adopted and as a reflex testing. Uh, the uh, breast cancer, uh, we have a breast cancer institute in our cancer center, which is a sub-entity, and uh, directly they order with abundant clinical information, which is an exception for pathology cases, but they put plenty of data. And also, uh, we have weekly tumor boards, which allow us to have a coming attraction for the pathologies of what is we're going to expect to be receiving. So not only we have the reflex, but we have the emphasis in the cases that for whatever reason, the history does not come through. We know that there is a metastasis, we know that it is expected to be breast, and we order the, the PDL1. Great. Tori, prior to this panel, you and I talked about how if a patient undergoes a biopsy at an outpatient surgical center versus a hospital, the process might be different. Can you elaborate on that? So in the hospital, we have a very standardized pathway as far as it goes to a specific lab and um, then goes to uh, neogenomics as an automatic pathway. If we do it in the outpatient setting, then it can kind of be the physician's choice where the pathology goes any additional testing. So we've done really good with setting up the similar pathways as um, both of these guys have discussed um, as far as having PDL one in place if we're doing inpatient testing, but in the outpatient world, it's still challenging because of the variation of the labs. Mm -hmm. And you know, later on, we're gonna allow for a question, answer, and dialogue with you all, but before we get too far, uh, and this is not an audience response keypad question. I'm just curious to know, show of hands, any of you working in centers where pd one testing for breast cancer was ordered and they checked 22C3 instead of SP142? Has that happened? Anyone here? No? All right. Well, we've heard anecdotally of, the, of things like that happening where essentially they're ordering the test, but they're ordering the wrong antibody for the wrong drug. And so when you've got those inefficiencies, sometimes the lab might run it, and then now you have to re repeat the test. Other times we've heard of instances where the lab says, did you mean SP142 and not the 22C3? And then they have to correct it. So we've heard of these things anecdotally that there's not only uh, the breakdowns in communication, but if the wrong test is ordered, then that can certainly lead to further delays in terms of the patient getting the results.
So with that in mind, let's move on to talk about a few other cancers, and then we're certainly going to revisit these, um, these topics. Uh, but uh, the next question for audience response is, which immune checkpoint inhibitor is approved by the FDA for the treatment of recurrent or metastatic cervical cancer with disease progression? So take a moment, look at that list, make a selection. We'll give you all about 20, 30 seconds. still see responses coming in. Okay, so the correct answer is pembrolizumab. Um, about 38% of you selected the correct response. Some of you are probably wondering, why are we talking so much about the, the drugs, the treatments? You know, I'm not a prescriber. I leave that up to the medical oncologist. And it's a very relevant question because we're hearing more and more uh, that the role of pathology, especially in tumor boards, is rapidly evolving. And I think in the past, pathologists and lab professionals maybe didn't really have to pay attention to the drug names, the indications, and so on. But especially with immunotherapies, and the fact that these tests are directly tied to a drug, and you have to know which test needs to be done and really understand interpretation and so on, it just feels, and we're hearing more and more that, you know, with these checkpoint inhibitors, the role of pathology, the role of understanding the right pdl one test interpretation, and also understanding the right drug is really important. And so um, I don't know if that's been your experience within your inst institutions, uh, but that's part of the reason why we wanted to emphasize some of these drugs specifically, knowing that currently there are six agents on the market and per potentially even more. Uh, so as it relates to this one particular indication of advanced cervical cancer, currently the only uh, FDA-approved drug is pembrolizumab. And this one, unlike lung cancer, uses D22C3 as a companion diagnostic using combined positive score, CPS, not the tumor proportion score, TPS. Uh, so we're going to talk more about why that, why that matters, you know, why is that relevant. Just very briefly. Uh, so tumor proportion score is reported as a percentage, and it's the percentage of stained tumor cells of any intensity in that tumor area, whereas combined positive score looks at both tumor cells as well as the immune cells, the, the lymphocytes, the macrophages. Uh, CPS is not reported as a percentage, even though it is a percentage, but it's reported either as like 1 or 2 or 10 or so on. Um, and I think one factor that has caused a lot of confusion in the community is that you know, we talk about PDL1, then we just blanketly say oh, PDL1 was 50%, or it was 20%, or 5%, without specifying which PDL1 test was done. So I think just providing that clarification, if that's the language being spoken at your tumor boards, providing, stepping up and providing that clarification could really put you into a position of really allowing everyone else in the room to know that, okay, you are keeping up and, and researching and, and really understanding what these things are because of the complexity of even within the same drug, pembrolizumab, there are two ways of scoring it, two different interpretation methods, if you will, and, and it gets confusing. Uh, so earlier I alluded to this national study. This was published uh, earlier this year uh, by Neogenomics. Um, it was a review of 62,000 cases of pd one testing. As a reference lab, they looked across all of these. Uh, they separated all the 22C3s for both TPS as well as CPS. They looked at 28.8, SP142, as well as SP263. And if you're interested, you know, you can look at the paper. It's, it's freely available online. Uh, what they found was within their study that 22C3 combined positive score had the highest levels of positivity. SP142 had the lowest level. And they also found that in this particular subset of, of uh, samples, 3.7%, so almost 4% of cases were considered quantity not sufficient. And what we have learned around the country is that if you are in smaller hospitals where you're getting just not that kind of volume, your quantity not sufficient might be far higher than 4% you know, for some of these biomarker tests. Whereas in other places, if you've got a lot of refined processes in place, perhaps it's closer to 1% to 2%. But most people don't even know what their QNS rates are. You know, they can sort of anecdotally guess, but they don't actually track this as a metric. So one of our sort of um, messages here is to say, if you don't even know what your QNS rates are for lung cancer within your own institution, 
that might be an opportunity. This was across multiple tumor types, so they sort of looked across everything. The other thing that this paper mentioned is that at times, when they received samples for either gastric or GE junction cancer, the test is ordered for 22C3 as TPS rather than CPS. It should have been ordered with the CPS box checked, but they, whoever ordered it checked the wrong box. So the lab ran it as TPS, then they had to rerun it as CPS. And it seems like there's waste as well as delays there. And it sort of begs the question of, well, who should be keeping up with the details of checking the right box? You know, does that fall under uh, the responsibility of the oncologist, the pathologist, um, the nurse filling out the form? Uh, you know, who is responsible? And ultimately, I think that answer is going to really vary based on your own institution. But just knowing that even a small little nuance like that, they picked the right test. They picked 22C3 but they picked the wrong interpretation, TPS versus CPS. Might seem like kind of a minor point, uh, but I think the delays that that may cause, as well as the repeat testing, uh, is certainly something that can be avoided. Just a couple other quick things about 22C3 and the combined positive score. Currently, it's a companion diagnostic for these indications up here. These numbers may change as the FDA continues to evaluate data, uh, but you can see head and neck, urothelial, and so on. You've got different cutoffs for what constitutes a PDL1 positive. And then when we switch gears and look at SP142, which is looking at the tumor infiltrating immune cells for both urothelial as well as triple negative breast, you've got these different cutoffs once again. So here we are in a landscape where everyone thinks, or I should say a lot of people think, PDL1 testing is just one test, you know, check PDL1 testing, or just verbally on the phone say, hey, I want to order PDL1 testing. Yet there are so many nuances associated with this one test, different cutoffs for what constitutes positive, and it's something that requires many people to really keep up with uh, the evolving science. So another audience response question is, how many of those checkpoint inhibitors, the PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, are currently FDA approved for the treatment of locally advanced or metastatic urothelial carcinoma, bladder cancer? So take a minute to guess or to select the right answer if you know the right answer, and then we'll look at the responses here in a moment. Okay, so most of you thought the answer was two. The actual answer is five. And, um, and these, are, uh, these are currently the five uh, PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors that are currently FDA approved for bladder cancer. Now, chances are within your institution, your oncologist may have strong preferences and may be only using one or two of these agents across multiple tumor types. But I think it's fair to say that not only throughout 2019, but even into as we anticipate all the changes that are going to happen in 2020, the landscape is just going to continue to get sort of crowded and more and more confusing. So how do you keep up with this? You know, what is your role during those tumor board discussions? And if you've got clinicians treating cancers that are not discussed during tumor boards, then what is your role either within pathology or within the lab to make sure that those clinicians, those surgeons are doing the right thing? Uh, one thing that we've heard time and time again is that especially with some of the GYN cancers, uh, you may not necessarily have tumor boards. Uh, so are they using checkpoint inhibitors? If so, who's ordering the pd one tests? How often are they communicating with pathologists? These are all topics that seem to be coming up over and over. Uh, so, so just keep in mind that these are currently the drugs. They, these are all the sort of nuanced FDA-approved indications. And you can see that two of them currently have the, um, the companion diagnostic re requirements. So as it relates to these other types of cancers, which seems to be one of the areas where perhaps we face some of the bigger challenges, whether we're talking about cervical cancer, gastric, head and neck, and so on, within your own institutions, you know, are you engaged in tumor board discussions? Who's ordering the tests? How often have you either had to intervene to correct or to make sure that the right testing is being done? Uh, we'd love to hear about your experiences. So this time, Dr. Zaretti, if you could kick us off Tell us, about a, tell us about your experience dealing with these other types of cancers. Well, we have a very robust urology service. So they, we have several uh, for bladder cancers that they do require. I mean, we have 20% of our cancers are bladders, and they 
do in all advanced and all high grade cancers, they ask for PDL1. Uh, that again is crucial, and I cannot emphasize that enough for the audience. Two more boards and communication is the issue with all the clinicians. But we do know with urology that they do want it for the high grade uh, urological uh, neoplasms. And uh, we, the key person who orders this is the pathologist. Uh, it's a lab initiated test, it's a pathology initiated test. So we are certain that we take the responsibility, but we are certain of what we are ordering for each specific case. Well, that's how, really how about other than urology, other service lines like GYN oncology? What is the level of communication around some of these tests? We have regular tumor boards with all of the services. A urology is very adamant, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very determined to, to, to get them. Other services are not that much. A GI, a colon, a pancreas, there is usage, but not is not that established. And it is, it doesn't occur in a reflex manner. We have the discussion, we have the tumor board, and then the uh, PDL1 is ordered. Mm -hmm. But in the case of high grade urological tumors, yes. Okay, great. Dr. Chivakula, how about you? Um, what I see in our oncologists is that they do not understand what the clones of PDL1 testing mean. Um, and they do not care to understand what exactly it takes and what the challenges are from the pathologist's point. So with that in mind, uh, you know, there were times when we were told that order the pdl one testing and not a drug name was mentioned. We assumed that it's Keturah, Keturah all the time. So now, fast forward into 2019, you know, uh, as we started communicating with them and trying to explain to them the complexities uh, of the pdl one testing and they see on the requests, uh, uh, for example, neogenomics, like multiple pdl one testing with a drug attached to it in the clone, now they pick up the phone, they tell us what the drug name is, and um, so specifically we are ordering them only after a verbal communication with the oncologist. Um, the only thing, uh, unfortunately, in our center, what I see is that the communication is not there much with the gynae ogs. Uh, although I'm trying my best to do a lot with them, uh, problem is they, mm, we have a wider age range of the gynae onks in that area. So uh, the younger gynae oncologists, and they're all bent on uh, the time I sign out the case, uh, within like two, three days, I see a request for NGS testing. So I do not know what they're doing with the NGS data in a metastatic or advanced ovarian cancer care. They're ordering the PDL1 along with that from foundation or some other companies. Um, and there are other gynae onks who don't even know what the PDL1 testing is, what NGS is. And so we kind of still, um, there's a wide uh, disparity within the gynae onks, and uh, that needs to be the gap needs to be uh, filled a little yeah, bit. Bridging, yeah. bridging yeah. some of those bridging educational, those, yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, educational uh, sessions. Actually, it's so. interesting that we face the same in, in, in GYN uh, areas. We send the same, there's a range of practitioners, there is a range of patterns, and there is a different sense of eagerness among some practitioners to order it or not. And it uh, depends on the individual practitioner that uh, is discussed on a case by, by case. And standardization would be really that's the option, the, 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 the optimal outcome of this. However, we're not there yet. We are in a similar stage as we used to be on lung or breast five, ten years ago. Yeah, and it's yeah, rapidly so. evolving, right? I mean, I think, you know, if we went back in history four or five years ago, most centers that were using these types of checkpoint inhibitors had most of their experience with their melanoma patients or lung cancer patients, bladder cancer. But now, if we're anticipating that multiple tumor types, increasing number of tumor types, these patients are going to receive these agents, then are pathologists equipped to know which test order and how to interpret those results and share that information with the medical oncologists. It's, it's really growing in the complexity, which really emphasizes the, the role of education. So we've emphasized tumor board several times here. That, that term can mean different things. You know, some institutions, it's a working tumor board. It's not really an educational session. Uh, it's more like a case conference. They actually use it perhaps to even have a multidisciplinary model of care where treatment decisions are made during those tumor boards. 
Others may be in institutions where tumor boards are more educational in nature, all retrospective and, and not really going to influence treatment decisions, but really more for education. Uh, so Tori, tell us about um, your role as well as, you know, sort of the role of navigation, tumor boards, education, all of that. So I have all of the clinical staff report to me, and so what we have realized is there's a huge education gap that we really face. And, uh, you know, the different subsets of PDL one and a lot of times the physician views that you're trying to tell me what treatment I'm going to pick if I'm going to tell you which, you know, drug option and they want all the options. And, you know, so going back and re-educating why it matters that we guide treatment and so forth um, has really been a big barrier, I think, to having more successful communication and better outcome for our patients. And um, I got more on board when we showed like the delay in treatment because we don't have a consistent unified plan and we've made a lot more progress with um, heading in a better, you know, um, direction in the next 30 days, last mm -hmm. 30 days or so since kind of showing them the delays in care and treatment because they're not communicating well. So we um, have, you know, the different complexities of the patient, whether it's um, pathology, the, the nurse is the one that really orders the testing. Most of the time it's not the physician and all they know is we're hitting a checkbox, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, yeah. and not the significant. So we've really done a lot of targeted education over the last year to address some of those barriers. So we, um, we, did, we do have an oncology journal club that meets and there are physicians and pathologists and then all of the clinical staff participate there. And then we've added an immuno-oncology journal club just to keep up with all the um, changes and guidelines and treatments. And um, that is supported by all of those um, members that I just mentioned, as well as a lot of times the drug reps are there to be able to help with questions or that kind of thing. So that's helpful to kind of pull everybody together in one setting and talk. Um, and then we do some case presentations on how we might could have treated somebody better or more rapid treatment. And so that's been very helpful, I think, um, for closing the gap for education. And then we do, um, of course, genetic tumor board. Um, we've worked in conjunction with Vanderbilt um, to kind of get that started. And we've actually started doing a tumor board directly on our campus now with our sites once a week. And um, I think that's helped just to raise awareness and then um, bring in the system lab directors from all the hospitals together and saying, what are our issues? What are our barriers? The pay issue, the you know cost and all of that was sending it out. And so I think that's been helpful and then working towards integrating it in our EMR system for all the ordering so that there's a way to close that gap. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, the notion of you know, IO-specific journal clubs, IO-specific tumor boards, uh, it's, it's evolving. You know, I think several years ago, the notion of a molecular tumor board seemed fairly novel at many institutions, whereas the academic institutions have that sort of as a standing uh, research meeting. Uh, but in many places now, not only is it molecular tumor boards, but this whole notion of an I.O. tumor board. And if you don't hold journal clubs within your own institution, taking a look at something like that earlier paper looking at the 62,000 PD-01 tests performed and the various issues that they identified, you know, I didn't get into it during our, our presentation here, but that paper also addressed the fact that sometimes the lab will get a sample and it doesn't even indicate where the primary site of tumor is. It might have been a, a bony lesion, a lymph node, and there's no, nothing on the form that says this originally came, we suspect, either primary breast versus primary colon. And so they're doing these tests in some cases not even knowing where the primary site of tumor is. Um, so just communicating that information, clearly it's easier to do when you're in the same system. But many of us probably work in settings where the pd one test is being done somewhere else. You're sending that information elsewhere. The lab does not have access to patient records. And so filling out those requisition forms with as much pertinent clinical detail is a really, really important part of the, the entire process. And what we have found in many cancer centers is the need to bring the nursing staff together to really educate them, help them understand the importance of this. I know that we've talked about that among the panel. So. Yes. Um, something I um, noticed uh, in our oh, I'm sorry. The microphone. Can you take the Can you raise it up a little bit? Or just maybe speak into it? Is it a volume issue? The light. Oh, the batteries? The batteries. Okay. Okay. 
Um, I just want to comment uh, something that happened recently that in our breast team was uh, one of the navigator nurses uh, who turned into a research nurse uh, because we got some additional nurses to uh, help the breast surgeon in the breast team. Um, what she is doing to submit the uh, workflow diagram, um, uh, what happens right from beginning of um, the radiologist, a patient walks into the radiology, and what the radiologist does, how long does it take to the breast surgeon and to the pathology, and when the patient gets the results. So she's meeting with everyone in the breast cancer care and trying to understand how long the time takes and you know from this process to this process and who decides on what test is done. Um, so this is something that they've been collecting the data. Part of the reason is our breast uh, cancer center wants to uh, go for the center of excellence uh, for the breast center, uh, for the breast cancer care. Um, so that's kind of pressure, but I think that needs to be uh, taken, you know, that example into the other cancer areas and probably lung is something that we need to look into and the nurse navigators and these research nurses play a huge role um, in trying to um, understand the workflow and you know have those uh, little gaps you know kind of uh, taken care of yeah absolutely I mean we've certainly found that when you've got those research nurses on staff you know in addition to them managing research projects if there are opportunities for them to get involved and engage in these quality improvement projects as well it really certainly is a, a valuable resource I know many institutions don't have dedicated research nurses but those that do uh, so let's shift gears. We're now going to get into our final topic, which is around emerging biomarkers, some of the future trends that certainly are, are hitting home today. And the question for you all with your keypads, at your institution, how often are PD-L1 complementary diagnostic tests ordered? So not the companion diagnostic, but rather the complementary tests. How often are these ordered? And so if you could quantify that. I anticipate probably about half of you might say D, but for the others, you know, let's see what the what the room uh, is like. So we'll give it a few more seconds. Please key in your responses. So about half of you say D. Uh, the others say occasionally and frequently, uh, which is great to hear, you know, and hopefully our hope is that they're ordering the right test with that right drug in mind and that they're not getting those things mixed up especially now that we're in an era where for many of these indications they have more than one uh, drug to select. Uh, so I showed you this slide earlier um, and all of those that have the bold red have companion diagnostics. Many of those also have um, FDA approved indications where a companion diagnostic test is not required uh, which can add to the confusion. Uh, but then we've got this growing list of tumor types where there's simply no companion diagnostic test required However, there is a complementary test you can do uh, to sort of aid with patient selection. And we've also anecdotally heard that there are some insurance companies, health insurance companies, that are going to request pd one testing performed prior to them approving therapies for some of these that don't have the companion diagnostics. So it's, it's, an, it's an era where I think it's becoming more and more confusing and complex because the oncologist might think, I've got this patient with, say, you know, uh, HCC hepatocellular carcinoma. I want to treat him or her with this pd one agent. And then the insurance company comes back and says, oh, you need to do pd one testing. And you're like, no, I don't. But the, in order for the insurance company to give the prior authorization, they're saying, yeah, we want to see what the pd one test results show. Uh, so I don't know if you've run into that or not, um, but we have certainly heard about that anecdotally, and we're, I think, going to probably hear more about those, uh, hear more stories like that. And so the question becomes, you know, what is the role of the pathologist in guiding these discussions, and how can we uh, proactively plan for that? And we're going to get into that during the panel discussion. We also wanted to dive a little bit into tumor mutational burden, not spend too much time on this topic, but we know that as more uh, cancer centers are ordering next-gen sequencing and sort of the broader genomic profiling, they're often seeing this number, this TMB number on the report. And perhaps they don't know what to do with that number or with that information. Um, but just so that you all understand, and I know that there are multiple other sessions here at this meeting covering TMB in much greater detail, but really this is the total number of mutations found in the DNA of cancer cells. 
Sometimes it's referred to as mutational load, and there have been prior publications and posters that have used that term as opposed to TMB. And it's reported you generally as mutations per megabase of coding area. And so far, most of the studies seem to show that TMB predicts progression-free survival. You know, is it linked to overall survival? I think the jury is still out yet. Uh, as of right now, there are no FDA-approved indications that has TMB as part of the indication. Um, but I think that might be coming in the future. And one thing that causes a lot of confusion is the lack of standardization for both TMB calculation and reporting. So when we say TMB, we're often not talking about the same thing. And fortunately, there are a number of organizations out there trying to proactively address these issues. Uh, one of them is the Friends of Cancer Research. And they've got this project, which they're calling the TMB Harmonization Project. And they've held a number of meetings. And I think the goal is ultimately to try to standardize what do we mean by TMB. So let's, let's all agree on a definition. Let's all agree as to how we're coming up with this number. You know, what, what, are, what exactly is the method that's being used to generate a TMB? And, you know, do we all understand it within the medical community in terms of what, what uh, we should be doing with this information? Uh, so keep your eye on this. I think within your own institutions, you're probably hearing at least discussions about TMB, whether or not people are actually using that to make clinical treatment decisions. And the topic of TMB is very, very closely interrelated with microsatellite instability or MSI. You can also interchange MMR deficiency. But essentially, there have been a number of studies looking to compare when you've got high tumor mutational burden, does that also mean you've got microsatellite instability? And you'll see, based on this <coughs> Venn diagram, based on a number of studies, and, and they've all kind of pointed to something very, very similar that if you've got microsatellite instability high tumors, those are also TMB high for the most part. But out of all the TMB high tumors, which is sort of that blue circle in there, only a very small subset of those are microsatellite instability high. Um, so MSI high probably means high TMB. High TMB does not necessarily mean MSI high. Um, but once again, if you start sub-segmenting this data across the different type of tumor, then the diagram starts shifting around. This is looking across 62,000, you know, all sorts of cancers. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, I'd love to hear from the panel, both in terms of your experience with uh, complementary pdl one testing, as well as the role of TMB, you know, is it being ordered? Are clinicians discussing it, using the information? as well as where are we going in terms of this whole complex but rapidly changing uh, landscape of immuno-oncology. Uh, so starting with you, Dr. Shivakula, uh, tell us about both complementary pdl one testing as well as your experience with TMB. Um, I would start with the TMB because it's easy that our oncologists are not using the data. So uh, the information, the numbers, that's our and majority of the times the TMB is ordered as part of the NGS testing. So, um, but when I uh, talk to them, they are not using the data. So, okay. information that's provided in the NGS mm, and report. Then so, experience mm. with other forms of PDL1 tests, the complementary tests. So, or? I said the triple negative uh, is a good example uh, of the complementary tests, and uh, we are seeing uh, an increase in the, the uh, request for the complementary testing in terms of breast and, uh, uh, and bladder as well. You mean for uh, the companion so diagnostic? For the companion, right? yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm. So, mm, for the complementary diagnostic testing, mm, not as much within your group? N not as much as within our group. Uh, uh, I don't see that. So. Yeah. I know so. within your organization, it seems like their preference of PDO1 in like, Drugs, you know, they seem yeah, to as have we were a narrow talking, selection. They're kind of more you know. uh, selected towards Ketruda, so they're not even considering the other drugs. So they would not be. So I'm not sure if I'll be seeing some complementary uh, diagnostic de testing requests. Yeah, Understood. So. Mm -hmm. Dr. Zaretti, how about within your organization? For us, uh, there are some clean, some oncologists that definitely pay attention. There's a difference between California and New York <laughs> that they do pay attention to tumor mutational burden, but not all of them. It's not uniform. And uh, again, it's uh, depending on the area, and the GI, definitely they are focusing on that. And it depends on the individual. And they do use uh, companion testing. You mm -hmm. know, they use uh, yeah. 
depending on the individual. Right, depends on the, so there's a lot of variability both in terms of the oncologist as well as the surgeon or whoever else might be ordering the test. Uh, Tori, your experience at Baptist? Oh, I have a question with, um, do you see that the physicians that order like TMB and are more engaged or more research focused? Like you mentioned, some of your gynocs um, primarily do NGS and the older population doesn't. Are they more focused in research? Is that some uh, of it that I, I don't think they're focused on research. Uh, um, they're just jumping in to get the NGS testing results, but they only look at the, their familiar genes that they know. That's what the information, whatever they want, that's the information that they're taking. And whatever the rest of the information, the TMB, everything is there, it sits there. There's nothing that they're evaluating. And they do not call the pathologist to ask, what does this mean? What, you know? So we don't have a communication. We started to look into if there is any uh, uh, code, a, uh, we can uh, uh, give a CPT code for the pathologist to interpret the test and pro the uh, NGS reports and have a concise report that we could do. But it was getting too complicated and the wording was uh, getting too complicated and we didn't know how much we need to cover and, and so the, um, so we just uh, left that part of it so you know so the reports go to them and that that is definitely an interesting topic because uh, some uh, in general pathologists do uh, spend a large amount of time trying to interpret these tests and communicating this and there is no code uh, on which we can bill for that service mm -hmm. Right. But, uh, and also depends on the individual. There's a great deal of variability. Some oncologists are on top of everything and they know everything and they read everything. Some other ones are not the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. And, and I think that the fact that, you know, the time that you're spending in tumor boards is also not necessarily billable time. So uh, that's one of the biggest challenges, at least in community hospitals and community practices, is the challenge of getting pathologists even to the tumor boards. I mean, we've heard of many institutions and organizations where they just have a very difficult time even getting their pathologists there. And so that level of engagement, the level of communication uh, is certainly something that we need to really evaluate within our own institutions. The other thing we've heard about is as we are ordering more of these tests, sometimes pathologists might off identify patients who might be eligible for clinical trials based on the results. So it may not necessarily be the medical oncologist who identifies the trial opportunity, but potentially the pathologist who might then bring that up during tumor board discussions. I'm curious to know, have there been instances of that or just even discussions about trial eligibility? Are there trials that you may want to have within your own institution around this topic? If for us, definitely is not the pathologist, but the oncologist who determine, who run the clinical trials. But on the other hand, regarding our optimization of tests, eh, and that applies in general to pathology and laboratory because we are viewed as a cost center. And it's very important that we demonstrate our value, that we add an immense amount of value to the institutions where we work. And this is a good example where we actively intervene and we demonstrate how useful it is on the utilization of these relatively new tests. Sure. For us, it's not that the pathologist has that responsibility or that kind of working that way, but I will say it's a system and initiative to have an integrated MR for our d results to go into a discrete field so then we can run reports and identify those patients better. Mm -hmm. um, so that is what we're working towards. Yeah, great. Um, we certainly want to have a lot of uh, room for discussion with the group. Uh, so now we want to actually open up the floor for questions. We don't have a microphone. If you've got a question for the panelists, we ask you to raise your hand, ask the question. I will summarize and repeat the question and direct it to the pathologist, uh, or to the panelists, I mean. Uh, so would anyone like to start us off with any questions about the topics that we've discussed so far, or even questions about what's happening within the institutions? And since I don't see any hands, one question I've got. Yes, go ahead. Can you repeat the test, the question again? So for lymph node metastases, in situations where we should be evaluating pd one expression on immune cells, what do we do? 
So it's a lymph node biopsy. Do we know what the primary tumor is? Um, uh, first of all, I think uh, the indication for the PDL1 testing is not in the adjuvant setting. It is more in the metastatic setting. So what you will be seeing and encountering and challenged would be the small samples that we will be running into, uh, like a, as I mentioned, bony sample or a small liver sample with a lot of uh, lymphocytes. Uh, or some other organ that we, where the breast would metastasize. Uh, but majority of the times, it would be the bone, and that's where we are challenged. But uh, when it comes to axillary lymph nodes or sentinel lymph nodes, I don't think we have an indication for PDL1 yet. And God forbid that happens, we have to uh, uh, go back to our primary tumors uh, where the PDL1 can be done. Uh, but uh, I would prefer to do it on a primary tumor rather than a lymph node where we'll be counting the normal lymphocytes of the lymph node uh, as well. So it would be tough to uh, do a PDL1 on a metastatic site. So, um, you know, that's what, do you have any comments on that? Uh, I know, he's a breast pathologist too, so I'm <laughs> asking him. So. Yes, other question, yes, in the front here in the what? Thank you for that clarification. Yes. I wanted to ask about the issue of collagen and your all's group uh, experience with that, with IHC. So the question is about digital pathology, IHC. Any experience here There's up on the panel? The paper said that there was good concordance between glass slides. And mm -hmm. Right. And it was all academic uh, pathologists with several academic institutions that had familiarity with both glass as well as digital in terms of that one research paper? We are, we are not digitalized yet, but we're definitely actively working on that and reviewing the diff our different options. But it's certainly the world of the future. There's no question for us about the rest yeah. of the team. I, uh, I think my experience with the community practices as I go and talk to them is that um, the problem with the PDL1 is that the scoring is so complex and the cutoffs are so complex. And uh, the pathologists in the smaller groups, they think that uh, it's an IHC code, 883. Of, mm, uh, three, uh, so basically, we are not going to be paid or reimbursed for all the hard work that we are working on. And we are breaking our heads on the CPS score system and the 5% versus you know, mm, uh, 0, 1%. So what they're doing is that they're not even looking at it. They're just send, doing it as a send out test. So you know, in that part of that, majority of this community practices are sending it out. So the point of even digital uh, pathology will not even play a role there until they bring it in house and read the PDL one themselves. You know, um, I think that's when we will see a trend towards uh, uh, digital pathology. You know, mm, uh, right now, uh, if uh, community practices have a ERPR KI sixty seven, that th those are the ones that. We are still doing digital pathology, but PDL1 will be added if they bring it in house. You know. Mm. So, so, a question mm. for the audience, for those of you who work in a pathology lab, are you doing PDL1 testing in your own lab or are you sending it out? So, those of you who are doing it in your own lab, would love to see a raise of hands. Okay. And then, those of you sending it out, 
Okay, so majority sending it out, and once again, I think everyone here, yeah. you all are sending it out for PDL one testing. Uh, but I think the landscape could change. But the complexity of having to manage and deal with all those different antibody types is one of the big hindrances of bringing it in house. Certainly, there are other issues as well. Other questions from the audience? Yes, in the back. Who would like to repeat the question and comment? I would love to hear from both Dr. Zaretti okay. and Dr. Shivakula's perspective. So and this is regarding so unstained slides, as well as the different biomarker tests that are performed. The unstained slides, they can be used, and they can be sent. Now, uh, regarding a liability, ultimately, they will be reviewed by the pathologist. Do they come? You are going to send it out to institution X that is going to perform the testing. And is, are, is the slide going to come back? Are you going to get an image of what is being read? How it does it? How does it operate? In, in your and then the, it does it come back to your institution for reading? Only the results. Only come you back. get the results. Yeah, so you're not going to get the slide back. So that, that is a challenge, and not for me as a pathologist, but for a lawyer, you know, so right, because yeah. uh, <laughs> it's just, uh, uh, the, the, the issue is that over there you will be uh, releasing a data or a report or a diagnosis on something that the, the pathologist did not uh, see. So uh, that certainly, I can, I can understand the quantity, and I wish I could give you a proper answer. Myself, I would like to get my slide back. I know that regarding digital pathology, eventually we, we will get an image, and that image will be uh, totally readable, and that will be solve the problem. But right now, I would like to get the slide back. I don't know your. So um, to answer that, you know, uh, majority of the practices that are sending out for testing, uh, the laboratories like Neogenomics and Foundation, they do require the block to be sent on certain cases. Yes. Like they do not accept the unstained slides, but they do accept unstained slides on some of the cases. Uh, for example, if it's a PDL1, you send out and they send back the slide for the pathologist to review with, along with the report. Then the question comes, how many pathologists? So what we have done is uh, we have asked two pathologists to review all the PDL1 requests that come, the addendums that come back, and you review the slide and sign out the report. At least you keep an eye on what's going on and how the report has been done. Um, and recently, with the uh, people jumping into the PIK3CA mutation analysis, a single gene test that's a, uh, for the ER positive HER2 negative patients, uh, I can tell you that tests went up so fast. Uh, by the time I discussed that at the breast tumor board and by the time I got back uh, to the hospital, which is like a 15 minute drive, uh, I had three requests on my desk to be signed out for the PIK3. That's how fast it, the indication has come out. Uh, and obviously, the neogenomics sends it to in a different lab, which does the genoptics, uh, and they do not accept unstained slides. Uh, and they do accept only the block. And um, I do not know the repercussions of, of uh, not reviewing the slide, but then we have a, uh, from these laboratories, we have this uh, uh, sentence that we put in, like a paragraph, that the slide was, uh, the technical component was done and professional component was done at this laboratory. Slides were reviewed at the lab, and we are just issuing an addendum. So uh, that we do not have anything to do with that uh, report itself, you know. So, yeah, yeah. In uh, your um, situation, it should be clearly stated what occurred to that slide and that it was not reviewed by a pathologist in your institution. Yeah, you have to put a disclaimer uh, that goes along with some of our addendums. Uh, the technical and the professional component was pr uh, done outside laboratory, you know, so, uh, and refer to their laboratory mm, details, you know, so. Mm. Other questions from the audience? So we've talked quite a bit about things like building inefficiencies, reflex testing, especially for patients who have advanced or metastatic cancer. Sometimes you get a biopsy, you don't know if it's metastatic or not. Um, I think one of the big questions then becomes here, you've heard the panelists say, well, then I call the oncologist. But what if you're interpreting 
a sample, you know it's medic you suspect it's, uh, or say it's lung cancer, perhaps there's information in there, you know, suspect metastatic disease, but there's no medical oncologist assigned to the patient. What do you do then? Uh, so then th these questions have been raised as to, well, do you just test all tumor types regardless of stage? Do you just contact a medical oncologist who may or may not necessarily be the one treating the, phys the, the patient? You know, how do we build in certain efficiencies where you don't run into those, uh, those delays? So I guess one question I have for you all, um, if you are dealing, say, with advanced lung cancer and it comes in, do you always know who the medical oncologist is going to be if the patient hasn't been assigned yet to a medical oncologist? And if you don't, who do you contact to, to know like which biomarker should be ordered? Ultimately, for me, will be if normally they do get, I'm fortunate that they have an oncologist assigned in my institution. But if there's nobody assigned, definitely I can contact the head of the director of the cancer center, the head of oncology, and he will be responsible uh, for uh, providing me an answer. Yeah, sure. There is an, a readily, readily communication. And that's, that's the most important thing with these therapies. You have to have to be uh, uh, in clear, uh, have a clear line of communication with all the interested parties in order to treat the patient properly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we have a variety of situations, and I'm sure that you can um, uh, relate to what I'm saying. Uh, is in a metastatic setting, you have oncologists jumping onto the patient even before the slide is processed, actually. So, you know, you're already told that uh, oh, this is a, a metastatic setting, you know, you're going to have it. Then, the other time when you call, uh, you know, you do not know who the oncologist is going to be. So, you try to call the primary care. From there, you go on to the pulmonologist or the radiologist who's done the procedure. Radiologist says, I was just asked to do this procedure. I do not know who the oncologist is or not. So, by the time you get to one oncologist, the oncologist will say that, uh, I have haven't seen this patient yet, uh, but if you want to order it, you uh, uh, tell me what the case scenario is, or I'll text you back uh, uh, if I need this because I need to go into the patient chart and see what it is. So you know, we have a spectrum of things that's going on. Uh, so one thing that we really want to make sure, and unfortunately, um, it takes a lot of our time and effort into it to track down who the oncologist is so that we make sure that we are ordering the right testing for the patient, you know, uh, for the billing part of it, not to overbill them with unnecessary stuff. And, you know, so and that's something that we are doing. The communication is the only way to deal with this, you know. Mm -hmm. And a similar issue that we've heard about in some centers is that what if that patient who's got metastatic disease simply doesn't want to be treated once, you know, hospice and sort of just, you know, symptom management. And in those situations, if you ordered these tests, it would have been a waste because you're not going to act on that information. Have you run into situations like that where the patient who's got that advanced cancer is not going to receive any kind of medical treatment and therefore the testing really was unnecessary? I encountered that kind of uh, case setting uh, actually at uh, the county hospital. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's kind of a very delicate situation of that hospital setting is that, you know, um, we are all the same groups of oncologists, surgeons, everyone go there uh, to uh, give the treatment and uh, you'd run this molecular testing and the patient, then you call and the, uh, uh, they're taking uh, the ER physician or someone would say that patient is too sick, we can't even give any of these drugs, we can't even think of giving any of these drugs. So uh, that's a response. But fortunately, this case scenario is uh, really a small percentage, but you do encounter one or two in a year. You know. Tori? So we've actually put a nurse navigator in one of our hospitals to kind of pilot it. So if we've got an internal medicine or somebody else that's non-medical oncology to biopsy something and have positive pass, so the pathologist can call back to that navigator and then connect them back um, with the you know medical oncology and get them streamlined. And also the navigator having that open conversation about where our goals are with treatment and so forth has helped a lot um, to, I think, limit some additional testing that maybe shouldn't take place in those settings. Great. And for us, I encountered a similar situation in the private institution, which is Maimonides, that's pretty much taking care. And everybody who the test is processed, they take action on it. On the uh, university hospital, we do have tests that are ordered on patients who are extremely sick, or then that they just 
they are not followed and they do not receive the proper therapy. So there's a lot of wastage on that. Uh, yeah. With less resources, there's more waste. So tracking the tests, tracking the patients, really making sure that it's appropriate. But of course, at the same time, balancing that with wanting efficiencies and not wanting to wait you know, one or two weeks for the results if you can get it back sooner. Well, yes? We, we don't request anything like this, but it still happens to us. We still wait for the order to come in, and the patient passed away before. Yeah. Even if you don't request, we still run into it. I get a lot with them. Mm -hmm. Brain tumors, they'll send out for the foundation, and the patient passed away before you get it. Before the results are back, yeah. So I don't know if there are any other last questions. Otherwise, I just want to remind you all that on the ASCP website that I mentioned at the very beginning, on the Immune Oncology page, You'll see a number of different programs. One that we would encourage you to visit is this one titled Overcoming Common Barriers Around the Application of I.O. And the reality is that, you know, yes, we're keeping up with the science. You all are here. You're learning about the science. And you can take that back to your own institutions and educate your clinicians. But on a very practical level, there are issues at a systems level that we have to really make sure we understand, refine, and improve. Otherwise, simply just knowing the science isn't going to be enough. And it's really our hope that we can uh, advance the application of I.O., really help you all overcome those systems barriers. So please visit the ASCP website to participate in some of the online activities. Uh, please make sure you fill out your forms. Uh, thank you again for your participation. And if you have any uh, questions, you can certainly come up uh, to the panelists. Uh, but thank you uh, for being here, and thank you for participating in this educational activity. Thank <laughs> you.